Heads up, friends. The unofficial Shopify podcast is made by indie entrepreneurs for indie entrepreneurs and may contain material not suitable for all audiences, like swearing or economics. Listener discretion is advised. As e com evolves, revenue is becoming less meaningful than another metric your profit. It's not just about revenue when rising ad costs and tight margins are at play. Enter Store Hero, your new ally in turning profit centric visions into reality. By bringing together your sales, marketing, and operational costs, Store Hero provides a crystal clear view of your real profitability down to each order's contribution margin. Now, deciding on advertising budgets with confidence is within reach thanks to a platform that prioritizes profit over revenue. Eager to embrace a profit-first e-com journey? Visit storehero.ai to schedule a demo and unveil a platform built for the forward-thinking profit-first brand. And here's a special bonus for you. Mention the unofficial Shopify podcast during that demo. Get a free profitability audit for 2024. That's storehero.ai. Ooh, the joy of analog. In a previous episode, uh, we had discussed vinyl. My my wife had recently started collecting vinyl records, and it turns out she's far from alone. Vinyl outsold CDs starting several years ago. And the, the joys of analog are not limited to odd audio files, to people with, with turntables. It extends to photography as well. Several years ago, I bought a Polaroid camera, uh, I think Polaroid 600, from a flea market. I paid 10 bucks for it. And, you know, once you own a vintage camera, how do you get the film? How do you develop the film? On the case of a Polaroid, of course, I don't have to worry about developing it, but they still manufacture the film. You could buy it brand new. I can get it at Best Buy, no problem. And so, again, there is a, a, a niche here, a group of people who are willing to invest the time and the money and the research into analog photography. So what happens when you make that your life and your business and you serve those people? Because I assume it's, it's your hobby and interest as well. So we've, we found someone who's done just that. Paul McKay from Analog Wonderland is joining us and he's going to talk us through uh, his adventure in film photography as an entrepreneurial career. Mr. McKay, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me, Kurt. It's lovely to be here. Lovely to hear that you are collecting a little subset of episodes around the analog resurgence. I, you know, unintentional, but I'm thrilled. You know, like just the analog stuff is fascinating. Of course, it, I'm 40, I'm middle-aged, and so it, there's some nostalgia there as well. Uh, you know, I can't wait until we start collecting. Uh, are people collecting cassette tapes yet? When are we going to move on to like other weird items? Yeah, mini disc players would be pretty niche. Oh, I've I've looked up prices on on mini disc players, and not as crazy as a Walkman, but getting up there. Also, like mini disc players, they've got like this cyberpunk, you know, retro future quality to them. I think that's what gets me. It's like anything that has a retro future vibe to it. Yep, and the and and the outside of like vinyl and film, board games has seen the same thing. Hardback books are meant to be killed, and now now you get limited edition physical books and things like that. So yeah, it's, it, it, it ties into a much wider thing for sure. So yeah, this is a larger trend where people are like, I just want to own a physical good again. Please just let, give me something I can hold in my hands and I know is real. I, I really think that's a lot of it. Um, so tell me about Analog Wonderland. What is it? What, what do you sell? So we sell photographic film. We sell film for Polaroid and the story behind Polaroid is, is pretty wacky. Um, we also sell 35 mil, 120, and then some of the really niche formats like 110, 620, 127 that people might remember. They're often the oldest ones, so sort of 100 year old, these formats. Um, we sell cameras, we sell some second hand cameras, and we also have an in house processing lab, developing, uh, scanning, printing your photos as well. So, sort of moving towards the one stop shop uh, idea for film photographers. Um, sort of five years, five and a half years old is the business, and we started off in the sort of the pure retail side, and then we've added more and more as we've, as we've grown. And the, so that was five years ago you started this, 2018? Yeah, May 2018. And how, how's it going? <laughs> it's going okay. Uh, I mean, the last, 
Well, the last year and a half has been pretty brutal for small business. Um, I know that's true everywhere, but in the UK, we've added our own personal flavor of difficulty by also locking ourselves out of our closest trading partner. Um, I'm not going to make any political statements. I'm just going to say that... I think you already um, have. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the upsides are yet to appear in my PL, put it that way. Uh, the downsides are there. Um, we also did some crazy things where we had a prime minister for six weeks who came in and made the cost of living crisis worse a year ago. So all these little all these little extra bits just to make uh, small business in particular slightly more tricky. Um, but aside from that, <laughs> uh, it's going okay. I mean, yeah, I think those, those things every UK business owner would be nodding along to at the moment. And then there's a few things that I think are niche specific. So we have the rather beautiful um, combination of trying to run a sort of a modern business with technology and products that in most cases are 20 years old, if not more, um, especially on the lab side. I mean, that stuff, there's a lot of things that that make life difficult. But fundamentally, I think you're right, that point of people just want to hold things and the the appeal of the physical. And I think I see, I see sort of two things. One is us lot who remembered it from the first time and it's like reminiscent and oh my god like that's my first family holidays were shot on film and I have photos of me as a baby on film um and then the the new generation of people who never experienced it the first time but grew up with an iPhone in their pocket like that was how you recorded everything who are now being exposed to this thing or, or re- discover it and and realize there's this whole other way of capturing a photograph that is not instant that is not immediately shareable that isn't filters and and is incredibly choiceful uh, and difficult sometimes and all of this kind of stuff and and that's hugely appealing to people who are used to screens used to screens so that's what i love about it the intentionality like at the polaroid it's like all right you get eight shots out of this and so you better really think it through and like each one is you know two bucks versus a phone i just rattle off a hundred and what's the cost there nothing right and it could just disappear versus, you know, when you have like the, there's just the one single photo. And then of course there's like an aesthetic appeal to it. Even if I, I digitize it, I scan it. There's still, you know, that distinct Polaroid look that you, like you could do it with filters, but it's not the same. It's never the same. No. And it happens to me fairly regularly where you're like, you make friends with someone and you'll add on WhatsApp and then you'll see on their profile photo. And I'll be like, ah, oh, show that on film. And they're like, Yes. Yeah, yeah, you can see, you can see. I mean, there'll be digital photographers right now screaming and saying, no, 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 you can definitely replicate that look. And you absolutely can sit in Photoshop or download filters that do it. And there are some people who do that and that's fine, but that is definitely not what most people are in it for. So how did you get into this? How, what, five years ago, what occurs where you're like, you know what, uh, I'm going to start selling uh, this weird dying hobby as an online store. <laughs> Yeah, so the life is too easy. Um, no, it was. Um, it's it's always been my hobby. So I, I grew up in that. I'm similar age to you. I grew up in that weird period where um, I, my first memories of photography were film. Then digital came along, and everyone had a DSLR. You know, weddings used to be like everyone had a DSLR for a couple of years, um, and they're fantastic for learning some technical skills very very quickly because the feedback loop is so fast, right? You just you just learn. Um, and but I just didn't enjoy it. Um, I just didn't enjoy the process very, very much, um, which felt weird because I had Polaroid through university and really enjoyed that. And um, and, and and then I came out of university and I started a corporate career uh, with P&G in sales and marketing, did that for 10 years and, you know, learned a lot and really enjoyed that and learned a lot about business. And, um, and, and analog photography was my sort of fun hobby away from spreadsheets and computers and data and fast pace and all this kind of stuff. It's very much the opposite. Um, and... Uh, I used to live in central London. There are a couple of stores that, that still served film photographers like in the film and the cameras and the developing. It's really awesome. Then I moved away to Yorkshire um, and there just wasn't the same support outside of the big cities. You know, if you're lucky to live near a local store, then happy days. You could, you could do it for ages. But outside of those real core hubs, there wasn't very much. And and um, and it was difficult to buy online. Like you could sometimes buy from Amazon, but there's film needs to be looked after. It needs to be kept at a certain temperature. It, needs to be, it goes off after a couple of years. All of these things you can never be quite sure. And, and a lot of the, the sort of the traditional stores didn't necessarily have particularly modern websites. And I just thought, um, you know, maybe there's maybe there are more people like me. <laughs> maybe there are more people like me. And I started the business with my mum at the time, who had just retired. I dragged her kicking and screaming back out of retirement and said, "Hey, look, let's try this. If it, it, it's a 
it sells ten pounds worth, then in three months' time we we use it to fund a drink each, and and it was just a fun experience. And but actually, what happened was within six months, it was like actually, you know what, there are more people like me than I thought there might be, um, and I was really enjoying it. And it's sort of time for a change as well. You know, there's a lot to be said about the stability of the corporate life, but the the enjoyment and the fun, the excitement was was all there. So made the jump, and then yeah, here we are, five years later. So is this your full time gig? Yes, yes, and has been for three and a half years, four years. You had a a corporate gig before this. Was it at all related? Did it were there skills you were able to leverage from that? Yes, and I think that's where I think that's where I really enjoyed because I always said about my my old my old life, my corporate life was I always really enjoyed the retail effect. I enjoyed retail. I enjoyed that idea of having products and, and bringing them to people and marketing them and it in a way that was, that was relevant. Um, and I also enjoyed the data side of it. I did enjoy it. Um, but I just never cared about washing up liquid. <laughs> there, I've said it now. <laughs> you know, or shampoo and all these things that I sold for many years. And and that's there's no criticism there that has to be done. But I always my ideal job was enjoying the life of retail, but with something I actually cared about. And then when you get into something like this that does have its challenges as a community, as an industry, there's there's so many uh, issues around the the history of what happened when digital came in and totally disrupted this industry that actually having some wider retail skills I think is actually probably quite helpful like I know how to operate on that big scale and there are still a couple of big commercial giants in in the world just in a very different means so I was trying to sort of match my skills to that in a much smaller much more relevant way um, but also in a way that makes a lot more impact you know you can see it in a way that you never could in a corporate life which is by far away one of the biggest appeals and so when you did say, I'm going to start this store. Uh, what happened? What were you thinking? You know, also like, where do you get inventory, right? Similar to, we, we mentioned vinyl, like a lot of it is going to be vintage stuff. It's going to be used stuff. You know, any, anytime we're, we're collecting, um, anytime we're into an arcane hobby like this, but like, <laughs> obviously, you know, people, I don't think people are mass producing chemical film anymore. Some are. So, Versus the world that used to exist, where every continent had big factories that would churn out, you know, a million rolls an hour to supply the world. And when digital came along, that obviously broke that business model. And one of the biggest issues, of course, is for an industry that's used to operating at scale, for that volume to half, you suddenly can't cover your overheads and things can go wrong very, very quickly, which they did for Kodak up in Rochester, um, for Ilford over in the UK and for Fujifilm over in Japan and several others of, of lower scales across there. But the good news was that enough machinery was saved from the scrap heap. Enough people said, I'm still going to be here until they drag me out the door. That when through the digital real collapse, um, enough people stuck around that when it started to grow again and it started to come back and people started to turn away from the, the, the idea that digital would solve all of our creative and aesthetic and uh, sort of spare time needs, there was enough there for people to, to continue to do. So, um, and it's a funny situation now where often we're constrained by these decisions made 20 years ago by people desperately trying to save the business as it was. Um, one ex brilliant example is Kodak. So they, they used to have a, I think it was a finishing plant in Mexico that used to finish a lot of the films, the last stage, and they had... I think it was 12 machines that would all run parallel. And they brought two up to Rochester when they closed and scrapped and demolished that site. And two's now not enough. And they really, really wish <laughs> they brought three back or four back because the difference it would make to now is phenomenal. But the fact they even brought two is the difference between color film being made fresh today and it not existing at all. Um, the Polaroid one, we've mentioned it a few times, but I mean, the craziness there is Polaroid went down and uh, a couple of the ex-employees said, we cannot let this go. But they didn't have the rights, the recipes, the licenses, or the machinery. All they had was their knowledge of having worked in that factory for years. So they started from scratch, from scratch, with the memory of the chemistries <laughs> and the machines, and said, what if we started again? And they called themselves the Impossible Project. Uh, and Good name. Be exactly. Uh, there's a famous Edwin Land quote that is something like, you know, don't do anything unless it's basically impossible. I butchered it, but uh, it's it comes from the guy who starts Polaroid, and um, and their first films were terrible. 
like terrible. Like they they technically worked some of the time, but not all. And the emulsion was wrong, and you could see it. But they were like, "We just need to sell some. Please, this is an investment in us. Like some of your photos might work. Just enjoy it, and the money goes back in." And they got better and better at it, and they grew and grew, and then they managed to buy. They managed to buy part of the Polaroid brand back called Polaroid Originals, and then eventually, a couple of years ago, it came full circle, and the brand and the license and everything came back together, and now they are Polaroid once more. But they have gone through this whole thing to come back to the thing. But without those, that without that team of people who said no, I will not let this die. It would never ever have happened. And now Polaroid are making brand new cameras. They've made new cameras. They launched one a couple of weeks ago, created from scratch. Hmm. They're launching new films created from scratch now they're back in that positive cycle imagine losing out on 30 percent of your sales simply because your tracking is inaccurate inaccurate or insufficient data tracking can lead to wrong decisions and missed opportunities it's like sailing a ship without a compass ever wondered why your marketing efforts aren't yielding the expected results the culprit could be your conversion tracking without proper tracking marketing spend can feel like throwing your money into a black hole but there's light at the end of the tunnel elevar Elevar ensures 100% of your conversions are tracked and delivered to your marketing channels. Trusted by over 6,500 D2C leaders, Elevar is specifically built for Shopify, powering your analytics with complete data sets. Brands like Glossier, Viore, and Magic Spoon all improve their tracking quality and site speed with Elevar. With Elevar, you can instantly deploy server-side tracking, boosting your Klaviyo flow performance by 2 to 3x and your meta performance. Every moment you wait is a potential conversion lost. Don't stay in the dark. Bring your data into the light. Get Elevar today and never miss another conversion. Plans start at $0 a month, plus 15-day free trials on all plans. Get Elevar.com. E-L-E-V-A-R. Elevar. So there's there's a revival that's occurring, and you just happen to be right place, right time, riding that wave. Yeah, exactly. And the fact that it's me who has my, you know, particular enjoyment of it comes back from the age that I am, that I could have that nostalgia uh, and and see it. So yeah, hundred percent. And then there's a load of beautiful craft businesses that are sort of spinning off it now where people are starting their own things. I mean, in the background, I've got just down there a, a four by five camera where someone has 3D printed a large format camera. Oh, look at that. With the craziest material. And um, because they... The 3D printing ability appeared. This guy knows how four by five cameras works and goes, brilliant. What if, what if we had large front cameras, but they were neon blue? Brilliant. So then he kickstarted that, raised funds, made those. And so you get this, this lovely cycle then where when people realize that more people are into it, people start to create things and they won't all be massive businesses and ideas in the future, but they sustain this community and this idea and this niche. And that's what's really then been really cool and really exciting people using modern techniques to try and solve things that were difficult before you know before you had to make four by five cameras out of pieces of wood and cloth and you know so your your woodwork skills were imperative whereas now i could send you that file and you could 3d print one yourself the oh i love 3d printing (laughs) anytime i'm successful i feel like a machine operator like i did it you know like i could go go manufacture anything at this point and of course you know couldn't be further from the truth um but so when you start something like this, how do you, the hard part is going zero to a hundred. How do you get those initial orders? You know, when no one knows to look for you, it sounds like maybe there's a community aspect here, word of mouth. What was it? hundred percent, hundred percent community word of mouth. Like we, the first thing I, and also it's, it's, it's one of the easiest things to do quote unquote easy but easiest things to do when you when you genuinely come from the community like i've met people in the last five years who have seen film as an opportunity on paper they've done the research they've spotted a revival they've they've added it together and they've gone da da we can capture a segment of this which is you know a very legitimate way of starting any business i'm not i'm not shooting it down by any means but the the upside of coming through something and generally just wanting to work in something that you enjoy is that when you know the word of mouth campaign I mean, speaking to people that I speak to and shoot film and who happen to run blogs that I've read and say, Hey, I'm doing this. And it was brilliant before we started, you know, I, I gave them all access to the preview on Shopify and said, like, tell me what's wrong. Tell me what you'd want to see or what isn't there. Um, so then by the time it launched, it was, it wasn't just me and my mom's ideas as to what they should look like. It was the community's ideas 
um, at least at the time. And of course, now I'll probably look back and find that website and laugh at how naive I was and how idealistic I was about how important images down the page are and all that kind of stuff. But um, but it, it meant that people would go on and they it doesn't look like somebody who spotted a business opportunity and built a website. <laughs> it looks like somebody who cares about film who enjoys retail. I think that's that's one of the the tough parts about you know having having a, a niche business like this. The people who are in it are going to sniff you out immediately if you're not genuine. And so when you're doing it out of passion, and then you're like, also, I'm not going to be mad if I make money from it, but serving the community comes first. That's when you really succeed. I think you know, it's just that that's the authenticity that everyone is desperate for. That's the reason they're after analog photography in the first place is I want something real and authentic and you can't fake it. You know, you have to have it available. And so it sounds like, you know, you said, Hey, we're, I was sharing the, the Shopify preview. Um, so or you, this was always on Shopify. You started with Shopify. What, uh, why did you pick Shopify from the get go? I had done, I think I'd, I'd played with a couple of things, uh, I think on Squarespace, like I'd done a photo exhibit a couple of years before, um, with some of my own photography. I'd played with Squarespace Commerce on that and had seen what it was like. Someone else had, had shown me their WooCommerce site. Um, and Shopify at the time just looked just looked the best. Uh, and I think there's an element where you sit down with like a spreadsheet and go pros and cons and features and benefits and all that kind of stuff and price per month. And there's an element where you look behind it and say what seems to be the intent. And genuinely, I think the intent from Shopify has always seemed very, very good and aligned with the values of somebody who is doing this, as you say, because they enjoy it. And if I make money, I won't be mad. It hasn't happened yet, but when it does, I won't be mad, I promise. And that that seems to have come true. Now, admittedly, every so often I get grumpy about some of the AI stuff. In fact, as one the other day, it was like, uh, you know, on, on Twitter, I was like, yeah, you can now use AI to like write your about us page. And I was like, if you AI is writing your about page. Like that feels like a problem. Like you're not building a brand at that point. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're just checking a box. Exactly. That feels like what well, somebody in a nice way, an accountant making a business because they spot a business opportunity. Again, it goes back to that thing. Like what's next? Oh yeah. About us page. I need to write something that is about how I authentically love this product and how I care about the specific thing. Anyway, but, um, but, but the intent of like how they approach things and, you know, some of the stuff they do and you look at the innovation pipeline and all of that kind of stuff. And it just, it just speaks to us. Now there's, there's times when we definitely run up against the edges of what's possible in Shopify. In fact, that's when we first chatted, when you turned me down, um, a couple of years ago, um, <laughs> I can't be mad at Shopify because that is running a, running a film lab is so far away from make a t-shirt, sell a t-shirt. Right. Well, as you know, from, from the conversations we had two years ago, like it, so we've had to go out and build stuff to help. But as I say, I can't be mad at Shopify for that. That is, that is not a wide use case and there's not much that's really applicable to either. So you've, you've been at it five years. You've been on Shopify. You joked like, hey, when, when we do make money, I won't be mad about it. Where do you see yourself in that entrepreneurial journey? Well, it's, um, I think it's quite an interesting one because I feel, I feel very in between. I think... And, you know, you, you go on LinkedIn or you, you, you listen to, to podcasts around entrepreneurs. And, and I feel like there's sort of two camps. One is very much the, hey, you know, I'm, I'm at the start of a, the journey with this brand. Like, it's really exciting. Growth is exponential. Small absolute numbers maybe or whatever, but but massive changes. Every month looks different. And, and I'm getting through this on adrenaline and enthusiasm and energy. And I feel like I'm out of that phase. <laughs> like, I, you can sustain that for so long, especially when you're doing it as a side hustle you have to do it and that's that's the really exciting fun bit but then at some point it becomes a day job and you sort of lose that and then i see this other bucket of people who are like you know wise old heads like rem, rem, remembering back when they were young and it was and then now they have these these 10 things to do to make your business successful and all of this and i i feel like i sit firmly in the middle care i feel like I, <laughs> i'm too old and tired <laughs> for the really young energetic i mean i have a young daughter as well which doesn't help but i'm too old for the young energetic adrenaline will see me through and I definitely don't feel like I've I'm anywhere near the point where I could give pearls of wisdom to anyone else um so yeah so I want more content for like a tired middle-aged man <laughs> <laughs> but tired middle-aged people who are, who are who are entrepreneurs by definition but um but sit somewhere between the two 
The you know I think a, a lot of that though is you know on social media it's everybody's highlight reel you know they're not they're not as inclined to share the hard stuff with you and so I wouldn't I mean everybody's dealing with their own trials and it's it's tough not to compare yourself but you got to run your own race yeah and I think it's also it's like the, it's, it's not necessarily even the tough things it's more like you know the first day I realized I'd have to, to I'd have to run a budget review for like the marketing spend or whatever and I'm like no come on I run my own business like this why am I putting in meetings that I know are going to bore me before I start but you, but you have to you know you have to do there has to be a due diligence side of the business as well as the fun exciting and I'm, I'm selling products I love to a community I really care about um I've also got to sit down and look at spreadsheets and on the topic of marketing what marketing what's working right now versus what what doesn't I, I struggle when you when you're in your own business again, and you don't have a big corporation where you can look at someone doing something similar in a different country or a different category. And you have all these benchmarks. There, there's things that are definitely working better than last year, and things that definitely don't pay out. But I also know that any part of my marketing, if I sit down for more than ten minutes and look at, I'll pick holes with myself on how we can do better. Um, but I think if I take a try and take a step back from that view, I think I think the basics are always good, like having a a blog strategy, an email strategy, a content strategy, really, that informs the way that you talk to people, making sure that it's consistent with actually what you want to be talking about. You don't get dragged into this trend or this topic or this thing that isn't really about what you're about. Like, Be clear on what you are about and then communicate it regularly and clearly. And yeah. what I've quite enjoyed in the last month is with one of our team, we've really tried to nail that down, written down for the first time. Like, what what are we about we can talk for ages and do interviews and, and go around the topics. But if, if I had to write down 50 words, what would they say? If I had to write down five things, what would they be? Um, and that's been a really helpful exercise and quite illuminating, I think. Because then you go back and go, well, we said this one thing that we really care about. When's the last time we told anyone through any channel about it? And it's like six months. And you go, well, either we don't care about it or there's a massive gap in our content builder strategy. So... Um, I'm finding that really interesting at the moment, but I think the the basics are not being, as I say, not being distracted by by the trends. We've all seen all the AI stuff, and I, I I'm going to shoot myself if I watch one more blog that is clearly ChatGPT written. Um, yeah, it didn't take again, long to be able to like just clearly spot it. Exactly, exactly, and and again, like, I'm not against it as a concept. We use AI as as as, as a copywriter, but it it doesn't speed up our work. It, it slows it down, but in a good way because it's another person in the room it's another thing that you say well you know let's see what chat gpt might write and then you incorporate it and you critique it and it it makes it better quality i think but it doesn't speed it up and you watch people who go from posting one blog every two weeks to look at this hundred blogs and you're like you've given chat gpt to an intern we can see <laughs> and 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 if we can see it's only a matter of time before google's engineers work out how to measure it and then it will disappear back where it came from Oh, that's a good point. It's only a matter of time, right? They've done this before. Like people who came up in the nineties know you used to be able to post what was it? Post a keyword in the same color as your wallpaper on the HTML, and it would. Uh, yeah, some old school black hat SEO. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. This yeah, the keyword only... stuffing. And it's an arms race, but fundamentally, take a step back. People who are into analog are particularly skeptical of that kind of stuff because it is against the reason we're here. Is because you know. People have different parts of the hobby that they enjoy, which is one of the ones I really love it. But fundamentally, it's something about the authenticity that comes through. And if you're not authentic in your marketing, if you're running it like, um, just like a digital marketing campaign would run it. But I mean, the downside is that also makes it hard because it's very hard to to work with agencies. It's not that there aren't good agencies or anything like that, but it's the voice is so difficult to strike the right chord. Um, right. It, it's really hard and then also something that's slightly more technical as well like if you're not using the right terminology it's, it's very easy to pick up very very quickly um which is great because if you're in it like me and, and my marketing manager like we both shoot film loads it's rare that we would and if we say something wrong it's because we're idiots not because we're not authentic whereas sitting down and teaching an agency film photography before you even get close to brand voice we, would just be so much work that's the issue with real technical products where the, you know the customer's sophisticated. Like the target buyer will will know it. They'll sniff it out immediately. Um, and then 
you know, because it's so community driven. Oh, you know, if they actually, if that becomes the reputation, well, now all that credibility you worked on is gone. Black Friday got you freaking? Get your store ready for the holiday rush with Zipify One Click Upsell. With Zipify One Click Upsell, you can capture 10 to 15% more revenue all season long by offering upsells and cross sales with every purchase. In just a few clicks, you can add highly profitable upsell funnels to your entire store, including on your product pages, shopping cart, order confirmation pages, and now, for the first time ever, even on the shop app with sky high conversion rates of 16% and an average order value increase of $18 per upsell, One Click Upsell has generated over half a billion dollars for Shopify stores like yours. Install it and launch your first upsell in just a few minutes to start generating 10 to 15% more revenue today. To get your Shopify store ready for Black Friday, go to zipify.com slash Kurt and start your 30-day free trial. That's Z-I-P-I-F-Y dot com slash K-U-R-T. And to get an unadvertised gift, email help at Zipify.com and ask for the holiday bonus. Like, obviously, online discussions clearly help you help the community. Um, What other community building events are in there? It looks like you're doing some some in-person stuff. Oh, 100%. And we have done, apart from that weird year with COVID, yeah, we have done all the time because... uh, Again, even through the the way that sort of the community held together through the digital uh, surge was there were a lot of forums. Most of them have been died eventually under the weight of uh, Meta and Google's various changes over the years. But there were forums that that kept things alive online and there were in-person meets and camera clubs and university dark rooms and all of that kind of stuff. Like back when I was up in Yorkshire, I used to do, um, uh, it was an adult learning course evening thing. I mean, it had a syllabus, but we all ignored it because it was just really a social. We'd all go using dark room and, and it got funding from the university because we promised that we were learning stuff at the same time. And that kind of thing always happens. So yeah, like as a marketing activity, we do photo walks um, where we'll pick a, a location. Uh, some of them might be themed because the idea as well is like, you know, we want to drive the accessibility to all and traditionally film photography, like many similar hobbies was primarily the premise of a certain demographic. Um, or we want it to be open to all. So we run LGBTQI plus walks. We run or She Hearts film walks where I'm not invited for obvious reasons. Um, female film photographers go around and discuss in, in, in a safe environment. And that kind of thing uh, is really important because, again, impossible to measure on any kind of ROI. But the good thing is it also feels less like an investment because ultimately I'm turning up and <laughs> doing my hobby with people who are also doing my hobby, many of whom are now friends anyway, or were friends before. Um, and yeah, then we can also turn it into a you know a blog and share on Instagram, and it's fun. Like we had a community event last week where uh, myself and a few other analog businesses in the UK put on an event across a weekend in Nottingham. 150 odd people came up. There were workshops. 150 there for an in-person all... event. Uh, nothing to sneeze at. That's not easy to do. No, I know, and 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 it was a lot of voluntary work from all of us. Um, you know, we charged for tickets, but it was covering costs and all that kind of stuff. But it was. It was amazing because people again walked out really, really excited about the hobby and the the community and the industry, um, and and that's really hard to capture. I haven't seen many other many other sort of I don't know uh, communities or industries manage to have something like that. But again, it goes back to the tangible nature. I'm sure vinyl probably does actually have craft beer, maybe things like that. There are certain things that that make sense for people to get together and socialise. But they're also the running joke on film photography is that we're not necessarily very sociable. We like to go on photo walks, we can walk around, you know, not not quite looking each other in the eye, but having a brilliant time. And you take two photos and then you go to the pub and just look at each other's cameras. But it's it's social and it's fun and it, and it helps drive everything forward. And you do, it's like, is it, you know, anal, um, Analog Wonderland presents, you know, October photo walk. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I just find it so strange that like, it's an analog uh, hobby that is primarily enjoyed physically with people, but we're an e-commerce business, <laughs> and we have to sort of somehow match this. And then you sort of go, well, it's not just that; it's like our our lab. So some of the scanners in there, because of the fact that innovation died overnight, some of our scanners run Windows XP, some of our scanners run Windows ninety eight, 
we, you know, we have to source monitors that are what four by three instead of sixteen by nine. Like you, you got the CRT monitors, which someone brilliantly rebranded as retro gaming monitors. So the price went <laughs> up. If you, like CRT monitors were previously worthless, you'd pay someone to take them. Now yeah. retro gaming monitor, retro gaming or lab scanner monitors. There we go. Like there's a there's a graphic of some of a of a of a workman running a floppy disk into a folder to show the process. But we can't let those anywhere near the internet. The internet would kill them, obviously, with all the viruses. So <laughs> we have to have like a tech stack that goes Windows 98 to a customer's iPhone 15. That's that's what we've got to try and design in a way that makes sense somehow. And then, yeah, with a computer that all that can't be updated, you got to air gap it, meaning it cannot be connected to the internet. So you then have to have like built in-house service and suddenly you're running an analog photography business talking about building your own service just to run the func the basic functionality, which is just bizarre. No one at the time would have obviously have anticipated this. And now we're sort of looking back and trying to retrofit it. And it's it's a it's a happy mess. <laughs> which again, like you know, Shopify is not one of help with that. And I totally understand why. <laughs> yeah, you might be one of one with that one. Um so I mean, that was a that tech stack, that's an in because you're dealing with with retro stuff. Um, an interesting and unique challenge for you. What uh, what are the challenges do you see or see down the road for Analog Wonderland? Well, for us, I mean, like like any business, we're looking to scale, we're looking to grow, and we've got some ideas ideas to do that. Um, and I think the interesting thing as well is like it comes from the community business side. We we have grown our business around what the community needs and what it's looking for. So. I look at you know other friends who've grown businesses and maybe they have a skincare business that sells skincare and then they want to expand so they make it a beauty business and that adds on hair care or that adds on makeup mm-hmm. and, and and but fundamentally it's still product store customer whereas adding a lab on was a totally different business model totally different needs from a website totally different experience for the customer but we've got to try and make it somehow coherent and cohesive. Um, and Shopify obviously is, is a good base for that, but then we've had to build software that works um, outside of that. We have to then somehow connect it to the things that <laughs> that, that uh, were last updated before the Millennium Bug. Um, and it has to all sort of flow in a way that for the customer, it, it feels modern. Because the other thing that, that is, is always a bit dissonant sometimes is this is a hobby that people will happily, you know, they'll start a roll of film and then finish it a year later. Um, But if they send it to you, they want the photos back within a couple of days. (laughs) And if not, they start to ask you, like, come on, like, (laughs) this is an 80-year-old camera and your photos are at least over a year old, but you still want the convenience of, and it's separating, you know, they have an expectation of their hobby that is slow and mindful and present and relaxed. They have an an expectation of their, their retail experience, which is modern and should be fast and convenient and should work on their phone and, you know, all of this kind of stuff, and it's um, so a lot of my time is spent trying to bridge this gap between um, sort of what's inherently possible and what these things were designed for originally, um, and what the modern film photographer needs. You're right with the the Polaroid film, even like with eight of those, it might be months before I get through it. Versus, you know, if I had to de- like that's instant, but if I had to develop it, you know, then all oh, right, I want, I still want that modern experience. Because I'm certainly not going to, you know, my local pharmacy, my local drugstore, dropping it off and picking it up an hour later. That's long gone. That's over. Yeah, and and, and there's there's a weird, like, cultural hang-ups that we run into as well, where there's still an understanding that one-hour turnaround was a thing, and it was a thing back when every high street thing had a machine in the back. It would be a one-hour service. There's still this this like cultural remembrance of this even in people who are too young to have been alive the last time that was happened. And, and you sort of don't know where it's come from. And um, the other one is like the way it used to work is you take in your film and you get back prints. That's what you get back. You wouldn't get back a CD or a USB or anything like that or an email. You would get back your physical prints and you'd have 36 and half of them would be out of focus or a bit blurred or someone's missed it and they're just gone straight in the bin. And then you have a few and then maybe one or two you might frame. Um, and we, we sort of, when we were designing the lab, we are like, this is madness, like, that's not the way to get the best photography and it's wasteful for the environment it's wasteful from from cost it's everything 
So we design part of our system is designed so that you get your films developed, you see the scans, and then you choose which ones you print. You go, right. Clever. So those two I love. I'll print them. And by the way, actually, I love them so much. Can you scan them higher resolution for a bigger print than I'd originally got? So, you know, you, you put it in, you see the basics, and then you then you choose what you want. And that leads to more people printing their best photos and really enjoying it. But the education we're having to do on people saying, oh, I want prints. Like, why is prints not an option on your, on your homepage? And you go, no, you will get to it there. And by the way, you're, you're 18. <laughs> you never walked into a, into a chemist that ordered prints. Yet, yet you're sat here saying to me, that's what you expect. And when I explain to you, like, yeah, that's, that's much better. That makes way more sense. But your expectation has come from, and I don't know whether it's movies, whether it's TV shows, whether it's just, as I say, this cultural memory. I just think that if you're starting film photography from scratch now, if it's clicked into being today, no one would say, I want to, I want you to print my photos before I see them. You'd never say that. That'd be crazy. Like, why would you waste all that, all that money in paper? I don't know how it came up, but my wife explained the concept of developing film, like how things worked before iPhones to our six-year-old. And when we explained the like, well, you can only take 36 photos and then you drop them off. Like you go to Walgreens and you drop it off and then you could go back, pick it up, and then they'll give you your 36 prints. And that's the first time you saw them. She thought this was the funniest thing ever. She thought we were making it up. <laughs> she was like, did they have color when you were a kid? Like in the world? Like she just absolutely thought we were idiots. I know. Well, I saw something the other day and um, where someone, I think it might be Reddit, where someone was saying, can we just pause for a minute on how crazy vinyl is? Like someone's looked at a piece of plastic, but if I make movements in that, that can be music. And you can listen to gramophones and things without any electricity from the physical movement of the needle. Um, and it's amazing. Like you, if you if you look at how the, the, the technology inside a Polaroid film, it is absolutely incredible. It's stuff that started 200 years ago, the first time people worked at how to make light sensitive chemistry. Um, but it's still being innovated today, um, which is just, it's incredibly complex. And, and the amount of precision that is required to make these things um, on a scale or even on a small amount is, is absolutely mind-blowing. So there's a, there, there's a big education component here for sure. Like even if I were to dive back into analog film photography, um, you know, even being quite experienced with the DSLR and having developed film myself um, 30 years ago, uh, I would still have to get an education. And certainly, you know, if my kids wanted to get into it, it's like, oh, where do we even begin? So if someone wants to dive into film photography, what's the first step they should take? So the you're, you're absolutely right. That That is a, a huge uh, challenge. And, and people also come back in, we see either brand new with no knowledge or like you just said there, hey, I remember this from 20 years ago, like, help me remember. Um, and there's in-person things. So, for example, at that event we did uh, two weeks ago, I ran developing workshops uh, where people were developing their film within an hour. Um, there's brilliant YouTube uh, series. So there's several sort of influencers in the field who do a lot of things like that, like, hey, here's how to develop a roll of film at home. Here's how to do a print. Some of the manufacturers invest in the education side as well. Um, for me, I think we definitely try and do a bit of that, but I think the manufacturers often the very best at that because they're the ones who are like, look, we understand these products best. I think what I try and do, not necessarily successfully, but I try and do is I'm, I try and uh, capture that that underlying intent, that underlying desire. So if I if I talk one to one, many people about the fun of it, it's I'd, it's not a difficult sell often to say, hey, this is a physical, authentic thing. Like, it's fun. The cameras are beautiful. There's history. Like, a lot of people shoot with their grandparents' camera, their dad's camera, their, you know, their, their uncles or their aunts. There's there's this sort of generational memory that's baked into some of these machines as well. There's a load of things that make it really fun. But how do you get that through when you're scrolling through Instagram or you're looking on TikTok and, and all of this kind of thing? And actually, one of the things we sort of come back around to is actually, well, What's the language that allows people to really understand what this is about? And the one at the moment we're playing with and it seems to strike a chord is, is saying, you know, this is all about putting the soul back into your photography. This intangible, human, authentic nature um, that is not technically superior to your iPhone. And by the way, my iPhone can practically see in the dark. It's 
incredible. Like the new pixels that turn your frown into a smile. Like that is how you take family photos and send them on WhatsApp to your nan. Like, please don't try and do film with that. But in terms of an authentic experience, in terms of doing something that you then want to put on your walls, it is way more likely to come about from a physical interaction, a physical experience, and your memory will be baked into the whole thing way more than just than pressing a button on the side. And, and it's sort of that education of what that means and how you can enjoy that. Then you find that actually people will hunt out the specifics because some people love developing their film and they will spend two hours on YouTube watching different comparisons and buying tanks and thermometers. And that, 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 is, that is really what their hobby is about, is the developing and the chemistry at home. There are some people who love cameras and will quote you the specifications of Leicas from the 1960s and compare shutter sounds and love that. And there are people who care not at all about either of those things and just want the final result or the experience. And so what I try and do is I just try and attract people to this and just like the analog experience, the analog joy, this is going to be brilliant, fun, you're going to enjoy, it's going to create something you're going to be really proud of, you're going to hold it in your hand. It's not going to replace your iPhone, it's just going to complement your photography experience. I could listen to you wax poetic about the joys of analog all day. It's brilliant. That's what makes the brand. It's that positioning, it's that messaging, it's being respectful of that and trying to share that and then, you know, provide education and resources around it. And then, oh, hey, if you need to buy some of these items, if you, you know, whether you're, div- you've got a consumable good, right? The film, that's great. A consumable good business is the best. If you want to develop it yourself, great, you've got that. Hey, you want to bring the stuff home, you got that. There's some fun accessories in there as well. I saw you do a box. The business is brilliant. Uh, if if someone wants to to seek you out, where do we go? What's the address? Analog Wonderland, spelt the British way with an extra U-E. So analog U-E, wonderland.co.uk. Wonderful. I will include that in the show notes. Paul McKay, Analog Wonderland, thank you so much. Thank you, Kevin. The unofficial Shopify podcast is brought to you by Loop. Loop is a returns management platform that makes returns profitable and stress-free for you and your shoppers. Loop offers automated returns, exchanges, and store credit options to lower costs and increase revenue. Do you want to offer at-home pickup or boxless drop-offs? Need to lower return costs or increase repeat purchases? How about all of the above? That's what's possible with Loop. Loop delivers customized returns management solutions for Shopify merchants of all sizes, like Studs, Princess Polly, Code Epoxy, to turn returns into returning customers. Find out why thousands of Shopify merchants choose Loop to manage their returns at loopreturns.com. That's loopreturns.com.